Dear students, with this lecture, I start describing a new type of basic tissues, the muscular tissues. As you know, the large number of human tissues are divided into four subgroups, main groups, and these are the basic tissues. Among them, the muscular tissues are characterized by elongated structures, which can contract very forcefully and quickly in an energy-demanding way. Uh, practically, every cell in uh, our body can uh, move somehow. So, to understand what the muscular tissues are distinct from the others, I like to talk a little bit about the movement in general. As you know, everything moves in the nature. The movement uh, can be divided into two types. We have passive movements, which require the external impulse, which practically mean that a moving object hits another one, and this other one uh, will uh, move away. Uh, this uh, mo passive movement doesn't require any kind of initiative, and the target cannot uh, decide in which direction, how quick it moves, and it doesn't require an internal energy source because the energy for the movement is given externally. In contrast, the active movement requires an internal control. The moving object decides when move, in which direction, but it requires an internal energy source for the movement. Those objects, those creatures, which can actively move, namely living creatures. All life forms can uh, uh, show a certain type of movements. The typical movements, which is present in practically virtually every single cell, based on polymerization in the death, polymerization of large molecules. What does it mean? That we have a huge molecule into which units step in and it becomes longer, or units step out and it becomes shorter. Anything which bound to the two ends of this long molecule moves relative to each other, and this is the basis of that. So this is practically based on the changes of molecular conformation, either the length or sometimes the shape. In this fluorescence microscopic picture, you can see three different things stained. The nucleic acid stained blue. This is why we can see very nicely the outlines of the nucleus. These thick red lines are the passive cytoskeletal elements, and the narrow green lines are actin microfilaments. These are the moving filaments. These are the general engines of the cell movement. Uh, let's see first a couple of examples how generally the cells move, what kind of moving activity can be found in the cell. Uh, the, uh, it can appear intracellularly and also extracellular. Uh, one of the typical things is the chromosome migration. During mitosis, during cell division, the chromosomes, which labeled blue here, move in the two ends of the cells to the uh, centriole, and these green filaments are the active microfilaments, which target-orientedly pulls the, to the uh, given direction, to the given pole, of, of the chromosomes. Here you can see an example, a kind of animation. You can see usually the actin microfilaments is a double-stranded uh, uh, molecular which uh, consists of actin units and they can step out and making the whole thing shorter. This is how the uh, chromosomes get closer to the centriole. The cell shape itself is a consequence of the active movement. As you know, after division, every single cell is spheric, round, because a spheric structure requires less energy to maintain. Any cell shape which differs from the spheric requires energy and active movement. For instance, these connective tissue cells with the long processes, uh, they come into existence in a way that opposite points of the membranes are connected by actin uh, microfilaments, and when they pull, actually, because the membrane is uninterrupted, they push out a little bit the uh, uh, cytoplasma, and they're making growing out, apparently, processes. Such a very complicated cells, like the neurons, which has many long processes with many divisions, all of them, uh, the uh, appearance or the formation, all of them based on contraction of the microfilaments. 
Uh, the secretory granules, what you studied in details with the glands, uh, also uh, uh, pulled to the surface to get emptied by active microfilaments. Maybe you can see a little bit uh, this uh, double-stranded line, which is a, a kind of a representative of an active microfilament. Uh, extracellularly also, externally you can see movements of the cells. Uh, typical things are the moving processes. Even the microvilli, which has randomly positioned active microfilaments and move just randomly, not uh, independent of each other, move. Even more organized movement happens in a kinocilium where we have nine pairs of tubes and this is made of tubulin, very similar in structure as the actin, just different position, and synchronized to each other they can move, they can hit in a certain predetermined, uh, predetermined direction uh, randomly. Uh, the other uh, typical cells uh, with movement is the phagocytes. They make a kind of amoeboid movements. It happens very similar way. If uh, the pieces of the membrane pull together, uh, the cytoplasm pushes out and we, it can grow out a process. When the process is attached to something, an opposite act active microfilaments pull it, pulls it back, the cells can move in the direction of this point, and this is how the uh, phagocytes can move uh, uh, target-orientedly, but also the phagocytosis, which, which eating up external particles, moved with the very same mechanism. Uh, you are familiar with the myoepithelial cells, which is around the sweat glands, both the apocrine and the merocrine. These are flat cells, which can contract uh, uh, at the neural impulse and uh, empty out the product, making a very quick response for the neural system to the secretion. These myopital cells are not muscles. These because the internal mechanism is still based on the same thing, the contraction of actin microfilaments. During the phylogeny, a couple of cells figure out another mechanism of uh, the movement. This type of movement is uh, very uh, energy consuming and slow because it requires chemical processes uh, to change the molecular. Consequently, it needs a lot of energy and it's relatively slow. Uh, for the adaptation of the environment, some cells needed a much quicker movement and figure out a new type of movement, which is, doesn't change the chemical composition of the molecules, but sliding on each other. And this is what you very well know from the middle school studies, and also studied in uh, biophysics, that the thin and thick filaments, which, which you name primitively actin and myosin, just sliding on each other in a controlled way. And this is how the movement happens. In, during this movement, the structure of the molecular do not change, just, uh, uh, just the, the sliding and some kind of uh, mechanism doing that. I will disc uh, you studied in biophysics and I will talk about that in a, in the, at the end of the next lecture. So we name molecular tissues those tissues in which this novel type of uh, uh, contraction mechanism but based on the sliding of the molecular is present, the rest of the cells just based on uh, the previous uh, described mechanism. Here you can see a summary on the all the three types of uh, uh, movement, the typical characteristics of these three types of uh, uh, muscles. Uh, the skeletal striated muscle makes fibers. These are elongated structures with large number uh, uh, sometimes several thousand nuclei. The nuclei located close to the surface, sometimes it looks like as if it were outside of the cell. But this is, even although these are long and these are named fibers based on the shape, these are uh, uh, cellular elements. Single membrane takes it all around and everything happens inside is synchronized. Uh, the cardiac muscle have individual cells. Each of them has a single nucleus. These are quadrangular, but they like to uh, attach to each other in a way that apparently it looks like a fiber-like structure. Uh, the borderline between the cells, similar to the epithelial cells, is very narrow. It's very difficult to see, but these made of 
a cell-like element. This smooth muscle, very well visible, made of single cells, of which the nucleus in the middle, and these cells are spindle-like. The size is pretty much differs. The size, uh, in <laughs> several things, the size doesn't really concern, but in histology it does. It sometimes only just based on the size you can determine which structure is that. What is the size of a structure is, at least for the beginners, is not really easy to uh, see. Uh, when you started uh, using microscope, you were told that the, the multiply be the ocular and the objective to each other and so on and so on, but this is not really informative. This is not good for real life. For the real life, and really under feeling, understanding, how being an object is, you need an internal standard in the slide. And the best internal standard, which has identical size always, and is present in every slide, is the erythrocyte, the red blood cells. Erythrocytes is present in the blood. Every single tissue has, almost every single tissue has blood supply. And the erythrocytes is visible. It's exactly 7.2 micrometer with a very little uh, difference. So if you compare the uh, size of the object to the size of an erythrocyte, you have a very good guess. If this is 5 times, 6 times, 10 times bigger, multiply 7 by that number, and you can have a very good guess how big this is. In this line, the relative scale of the object that I draw is based on the uh, uh, relative size to the uh, erythrocyte. The, among the three uh, muscles, the skeletal muscle is the biggest. It has 50 to 100 micrometer in diameter, most of them close to 100 micrometer, so it's much, much bigger than the erythrocyte. The length of a fiber is very variable, from 1 millimeter to 70 centimeter long. The cardiac muscle is smaller. It has a bigger variation in diameter, but usually a half, one third of as big, 30, 50 micrometer, uh, uh, which is smaller than the skeletal muscle. The, uh, the length of the cells is 80 to 200 micrometer long. The smallest of each is the smooth muscle. The diameter is 3 to 8 micrometer. As you know, it's smaller usually than uh, compared to the erythrocyte. And uh, so it's much, much small, uh, smaller than the old other one. And this is 15 to 200 micrometer in size. This disherence is not visible when we make a kind of basic mapping, basic show on what the uh, units of the muscle look like. It has different power. The skeletal muscle needs a big power just for the external movement. This is it's very powerful. 100 watt a kilogram muscle can uh, tell. The uh, cardiac muscle is much weaker. The cardiac muscle was not designed for strength, but reliability. It cannot afford to stop its working for uh, five minutes or an hour because it has very serious consequences. It must work continuously, and the internal buildup was designed for reliability and not for strength. The smooth muscle is something in between. It can be relatively almost one third as forceful as the skeletal muscle, but it can be weaker as well. The contraction, uh, the skeletal muscle can contract by 34% this original way. So this is, is a longest size, about 30% can be contracted. So up to, down to 70% of the original size. Uh, this contraction is fast powerful, but it becomes exhausted very soon, so it needs, uh, it's tires very soon, it needs uh, to have a rest after a work. The cardiac muscle, as I mentioned, it can contract also by 30%, same way as the skeletal muscle, but it can work and must work continuously and reclaiming. Practically, in, for a half a second, it contracts, another half a second it relaxes, and this rhythmic contraction we should do if everything goes well for a hundred years. The smooth muscle contracts much uh, better, so the, by 80%, down to 20% of the original size, but contraction is much slower than the, uh, that of the two other muscles, but it can contract long-lasting. A smooth muscle can contract for days, 
without interruption, and this is absolutely necessary for the appropriate function of some of our organs. The control is also differs. The skeletal muscle controlled neural neurally and voluntarily. We can contract every single uh, skeletal muscle fibers if we wish so. It, uh, it's not a contradiction, but sometimes also reflectorily contract, but we can control them, every single fibers, voluntarily. The cardiac muscle is a pretty much self-control. It doesn't require uh, nerves or any other things externally to work. The heart, if it's uh, deprived of all the environment that gets appropriate food and oxygen, it still keeps working uh, rhythmically. External things can modify the activity of the heart, so we can, uh, different, uh, the, uh, the heart rate and the strength can be different, but basically they are self-controlled. The smooth muscle has a neurohumoral control, which means that both the nerve fibers and the bioactive materials, humoral refers to that, will uh, make it contract. And finally, where can we find it? In the, the skeletal muscle can be found, of course, the skeletal muscle, those muscles you came across in the dissecting room. The tongue and the pharynx are also the typical examples of the skeletal muscle. The cardiac muscle present, of course, in the heart, and but the end of the large veins may also contain a couple of cardiac muscle cells. The smooth muscle is located in the internal organs, in our viscera, and most of the vessels, especially the mesial-sized arteries, contains a lot of smooth muscle. After that, I start describing details on the skeletal muscle. The skeletal muscle is the, uh, the one you beat in the dissecting room. The unit, as I mentioned, is a fiber. It's a long parallel structure, and this is, uh, has many nuclei. Nuclei is on the surface very close to that, and the nuclei are active. You can see it has a very loose chromatin. If the, uh, any cell is busy, in this case, a lot of things happening between the DNA thread. So the DNA thread pushed away from each other, and they are in a larger area, consequently, and the area is paler. Uh, in bit, uh, the uh, muscle fibers has a typical cross striation, about one micrometer in periodicity, which is better visible in specialty uh, stained, in this case, iron hematoxylin stained slide, but with hematoxylin eosin is also visible. Between the muscle fibers, you can see uh, dark, uh, narrow nuclei. These nuclei belong to the, also here, belong to fibrocytes. And this is a connective tissue between the muscle fibers, which makes a service function. We have three sets of connective tissue in the skeletal muscle, in the muscle. The epimysium is located on the surface. The entire muscle, this looks like a capsule of the muscle, is uh, uh, surrounded by a connective tissue. This not to be mixed with the fascia. Fascia is also a thin layer of connective tissue attached to the muscle, but you can easily remove it. It's a different type of structure. Epimysium is an built-in component of the muscle. Beside perimysium, we have uh, via epimysium, we have perimysium. Perimysium divides the muscle fibers into bundles. And this perimysium can be visible also with new naked eyes if you are in a kitchen and cut meat just across. In many meats you can see this nice drawing, which is the perimysium, showing the uh, bundles of the muscle fibers. And finally, every single muscle fiber is surrounded by connective tissue fibers and every now and then fibrocytes. And this connective tissue, which is intimately connected to uh, muscle fibers, named endomysium. Uh, it's important to say, and also mentioned uh, with the bones, that the collagen fiber, the connection of the connective tissue around the muscle, also the ligaments and the bones, is continuous. We have the so-called Sharpe fibers. Sharpe fibers, is, as I remember from the lecture on the histology lecture on the bones, that these are collagen fibers, which are deeply embedded in a bone. When they reach the surface, it's not stops, but continues with other structure. 
moreover, not only continues, but passing through it. Whenever a muscle attached to a bone through a tendon, uh, the, this uh, tendon is uh, connective tissue fibers, then this connective tissue continues with the three layers of connective tissue, epiperian, the endomysium. After the other, close to the other end uh, of the muscle, when there is no more muscle fibers, this connective tissue goes further on to the other tendon and becomes deeply embedded into the other bone. Uh, consequently, this connective tissue builds an uninterrupted bridge between two uh, uh, bones and we can imagine that the muscle is a ligament in which inside the ligament between the fibers we have guest muscle fibers to contract. But the, con the connective tissue is continuous. This is what ensures a very stable uh, uh, contraction, uh, connection between the muscles and the bones. Now, let's uh, talk about the muscle fibers. The muscle fibers, as I mentioned, has a cross striation, and inside we have myofibrils. If you see in the slides, we can see little dots, a couple of tenths of micrometer dots, which is visible in light microscope. We have a higher power uh, uh, hematosynapsin stain slides, every single dot here. So this is a muscle fiber, and these dots are the myofibrils. The myofibrils are not evenly distributed, but it has a certain pattern. I think it's not, don't, do not doesn't have too much practical significance, but it's named after Conheim, Conheim pattern. Some of the examiner may be interested in that, so at least till the exam you might remember that. The myofilaments are the units of the muscle at molecular level. These are the structures, what you study in the middle school as actin and myosin, and these are the common name from them, the myofilaments. If you see the finer structure of the muscle, this was the picture you see in the previous uh, panel. Uh, here, the key part of the picture, this is the uh, myofibril. Here actually have two myofibrils, one is to here, the other is here, and the borderline between the two myofibrils is visible. It is shown that the elements are very well synchronized, especially by the Z-membranes. Consequently, we can see the periodicity. Uh, the, you studied in biophysics the various stripes, just a real um, short repetition, the dark one named anisotropic A, the pale one with isotropic, right? In the middle of the pale, and that's the most important part functionally, we have the Z membrane, which is a contract center of the muscle. The M stripe is a darker area in the, in the middle of the A. This is for, uh, the pla uh, place of proteins which connecting the myosins together. And the H is an area in which we have only myosin, a little bit lateral, is more dark, and this is what we have uh, overlapping myosin and active molecules. The unit is the sarcomere. This is an area between two Z membranes. And whenever the muscle contracts, these two Z membranes getting closer to each other, and consequently the entire muscle fiber becomes shorter. Here you can see the already seen mechanism that uh, by sliding the actin filaments between the myosin filaments makes this contraction. In this uh, model, which is a kind of electromicroscopic uh, picture, uh, a model based on electromicroscopic pictures, is I like to uh, describe some important uh, components, features of the skeletal muscle. First of all, the entire skeletal muscle is surrounded by this uh, membrane, which is named sarcolemma. Sarcos is uh, Greek for muscle, lemma is Greek for membrane. This practically means that the membrane of the muscle. The, the structure is very similar to that of the every, any kind of cell. Uh, the, the sarcolemma, the membrane, is surrounded by the basement membrane. Every single muscle fiber is surrounded by the basement membrane, which is attached to the uh, uh, sarcolemma by uh, uh, glycoproteins named integrin and laminin type. Uh, the outside of the basement membrane, you can see collagen fibers and sometimes fibrocytes. These are the components of the endomysium, the internal, most internal uh, component of the connective tissue layers 
in the muscle. The sarcoplasm, similar to the cytoplasm, is a liquid structure inside the membrane. It's a structureless area. And uh, the most important component is the myoglobin. Myoglobin is a big protein which is able to bound oxygen. Structure is similar, shows a lot of similarity to the hemoglobin, which makes the blood red. And this is also red. When we take all the blood out of the muscle, this is still keep be, being red because of the myoglobin content in the uh, sarcoplasm. Uh, the function similar to the hemoglobin is the oxygen storm. Actually, the affinity to oxygen of the myoglobin is four times higher than uh, that of the hemoglobin. This is why it's stealing the oxygen out of the blood whenever it's possible. It has a good reason to do that, because the skeletal muscle can contract so hard that during the contraction it fully compresses the vessels inside, and when it starts contracting, the blood supply stops. Now it has to live on its own oxygen reserve, which is taken from the myoglobin. Beside the myoglobin, we have nutrition in the sarcoplasm. This is mostly glycogen and uh, lipids, and these are burned in the mitochondria with oxygen, producing ATP, which is, as you know, the energy money of many chemical processes, including the contraction of the muscle. Whenever we contract our muscle for a long period of time, and uh, uh, there is no oxygen supply from the blood, uh, and the oxygen from the myoglobin also uh, exhausted, the muscle can have a small energy slightly furthermore. And this is, as you studied in bi uh, biochemistry, the anaerobic glycolysis during which the, uh, the glucose burns, but glucose disintegrates, practically not burns, but uh, the result is not oxygen and water, uh, the, not, uh, water and carbon dioxide, but lactic acid. It produces less energy, but still produces a certain type of energy. And the big problem is that lactic acid is poisoning. It makes the environment acidic. It doesn't go away as quickly as the carbon dioxide. And this will poison the, mus uh, the muscles. If you use your muscles extensively, as a good physical exercise or a good disco, next day you feel a pain in your muscle, and this is a poisoning of the, with lactic acid. Of course, you can get rid of it. Uh, it does a traditional way. If you move it loose, increase the blood circulation, and it will wash the lactic acid away. Uh, the nucleus, as I mentioned, we have a large number of nuclei. These nuclei are just under the surface and they are active. They have loose chromatin because a lot of things happening between the DNA thread. It requires a lot of uh, uh, things to do, replacing proteins and whatever. The myofibrils are the engines of the uh, uh, muscle fiber. These are which is responsible for the contraction. and. Uh, uh, this, uh, the uh, function of which was described in details in biophysics and also a brief description before. Uh, the, uh, it is uh, worth mentioning that we have differences in muscles. How many myofibrils is in a certain volume of the muscle fibers? Sometimes we have relatively little. In this case, the sarcoplasm takes bigger place. Consequently, we have more myoglobin there and this has a bigger uh, oxygen store. This, is, this muscle is weaker than the average, but can be work longer lasting because it has much bigger oxygen store. Those muscles in which there's a lot of myofibrils at the expense of the uh, myoglobin, they, they are stronger, but they will depleted very soon. They will be tired very soon. This is like a big race car with a very small uh, tank. And it, it can, it's very forceful, but can run just a further long distance. Uh, this uh, proportion between the myofibrils and the, the myoglobin is visible on the meat with naked eyes. Those uh, 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 muscles, which has relatively few myofibrils, a lot of myoglobins look red. Whoever has 
a lot of myofibrils and relatively little myoglobin because the myofibril is made of protein and the protein is white, a little yellowish. These are so-called white meat. You know from the gastronomy which meat are white and red. And this is based on the proportion of these two components. Mitochondria, these are the energy power plant of the cells inside the mitochondria. The, with oxygen, the nutrition will burn and producing ATP, which is the energy money of the cells. Uh, beside that, we have two tube system inside the skeletal muscle, which serves two different purposes. One of them is a sarcotubular system. This red tube system represents that. Important thing is that this is connected to the surface. Its membrane is continuous with the surface membrane, and the cavity is continuous with the outside world. What is inside of this uh, tube system, it really doesn't make any, sense, uh, any importance. Whatever is important is the membrane. As you know, the skeletal muscle is controlled by the neural impulses. Whenever the neural impulse reaches the surface of the muscle, an action potential like structure is generated on that. This action potential will propagate through the membranes of the circuitubular system and conducting the impulse much quicker than any other things. Traditionally, the information from the membrane to the inside the cell goes by signal transducting molecules, and these are diffusing relatively slow because the uh, skeletal muscle is huge and it requires a very quick response, this time make it unusable, the muscle. The electric wires, electric impulses are much quicker than the diffusion of the bioactive molecules. This is why it gives a kind of good, quick information panel. This uh, sarcotubular system uh, usually have a double uh, uh, tube system on the two sides of the Z membrane, and very probably this is how the information is given over to the myofibrils. The other uh, uh, system is the sarcoplasmatic reticulum. This orange color uh, uh, network is represents that. This is not connected to the outside world, not connected to the membrane, but whatever is important is what's inside. And inside these uh, 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 complicated tube system is calcium, calcium ions. And the calcium is a very important uh, signal transmitter in the skeletal muscle, as you studied in biophysics and also we'll mention in the next lecture. And uh, this is a kind of reserve of calcium required for the quick response of the skeletal muscle. Uh, that was the most important details on the structure of the skeletal muscle. Now let me spend a few words on how the muscle fibers develop. This is not as complicated as the bone, but it's really worth some words to describe. Like all the tissues develop from stem cells, and the very first stem, uh, step is to make progenitor cells. As you remember from the previous lecture, pro the progenitor cells are such cells which at molecular level, genetic level, already differentiated, decided itself to make an other in a certain direction, but practically it didn't know, do anything for that purpose, only just they, they genetically determined. When it starts doing something, they turn to be blast cells, and because every single uh, activity based on proteins, the first thing is to uh, make the protein-making machinery, the ribosomes. Uh, the ribosomes, uh, on the surface of the ribosomes, it starts to produce contractile elements, the myofilaments, and, these, uh, and these cells become filled with myofilaments, and this is what we name myoblast, uh, which already has the contractile elements. And that, at this point, comes a very strange and unique step. Many, many individual cells to reach that level will fuse each other, communicate, and making a long structure with a large number of nuclei. So the muscle fiber is not developed in a way that the nuclei is dividing and more nucleus is present there, but many individual cells use each other. 
And this is what we have, the so-called pro-myocyte, in which the contratec element is disintegrated. And finally, there will be an integrated regular structure, the myofibrillus, which makes the uh, muscle fiber. I watch your attention to these cells. These cells are myoblast cells, similar to the others, but they do not fuse each other. So these are not practically aggressive or sociopathic cells, but they have their own function. These are replacement myoblasts, and any time when we have injury or any kind of replacement or correction of the muscle fiber is necessary, these cells are activating themselves and they will pre repair the damaged muscle. No. Uh, we reach the point is the muscle regeneration or reparation. Every now and then it happens that we break a couple of body parts and can happen with the muscles. Luckily enough, most of the time, just a couple of muscle fibers break, but many muscle fibers keep in place. Consequently, the broken muscle fibers will be very close to each other, and as a biochemical signal from the damaged cells will wake up these satellite cells. The satellite cells stand in between the broken ends. And similar well as I described before, they lined up and they will completely repair uh, this one. So the satellite cells is responsible for muscle regeneration. Of course, if the entire muscle is broken, you need a surgical intervention, just pull them together doesn't matter which point is which point, and the uh, hard-working satellite cells still will repair the muscle, and s after a certain time, it can be practically completely good. Uh, the other components are these are connective tissue. The connective tissue, the endo and perimysium, also repairs, and for that requires fibroblast, and the fibroblast is uh, coming from the stem cells. You know, we have stem cells all around the body. The so-called pericytes in the capillaries are stem cells. Uh, there is one more thing, is the muscle thickening. Uh, it's very fashionable nowadays that some uh, people who has mentally, not really man-like manhood, like to replace the mental manhoodness with bodily symptoms. And this is why the bodybuilding is uh, uh, very fashionable. How the muscles can be thickened? There is two ways. Number one, which is generally accepted, is the hypertrophy, which means that the muscle fibers become thicker. How a muscle fibers can be thicker? Actually, more myofilaments, more myofibrils, sorry, uh, is built, and of course, myofilaments as well. And in the myo uh, muscle fibers, more myofibrils are present, become thicker and stronger. There is another possibility is the so-called hyperplasia, when new muscle fibers are built. Uh, this is disputed in some books, but there is a more and more evidence it really does happen, even in human being. And if you have an excessive uh, uh, workout, you can uh, really have new muscle fibers. The mechanism is uh, known. Satellite cells woke up a similar way as if the muscle fibers would broken, get the, uh, the biochemical signals, they will multiply, they line up between the existing muscle fibers and make a new muscle fibers. Similarly, the fibroblasts make a new connective tissue environment. Uh, important to say that the signal for both the hypertrophy and the hyperplasia is the lactic acid. So whenever you excessively use your muscles, there is an internal mechanism when a lot of lactic acid appears, the muscle initiate a biochemical thinks, thinking that I need more and more muscles because I need to work more. Consequently, all the processes, both the hyperplasia and the hypertrophia, will be initiated by the lactic acid. Consequently, there is no thicker muscle without pain. Doesn't matter who says what, without lactic acid poisoning, it means a uh, muscle cater, you have no uh, thicker muscle. This is what I wanted to talk about today, and in the next lecture we continue describing the two other muscle types, the cardiac and the smooth muscle. 
Thank you very much for your attention.